It's that back position. Yeah. What's up, Prime Fam? As you can tell from that awesome intro, we're going to be discussing the high bar squat, specifically what it trains from a biomechanical standpoint in relation to the low bar squat. It is not simply more quote unquote quad dominant. There is a little bit of truth to that, but there's a lot of nuance that gets misconstrued when people discuss the high bar squat because they kind of reduce it down to just this amalgamation of the low bar squat that is more quad dominant. This is really actually missing quite a bit of the high bar squat. So I want to discuss more of the nuanced details on really what the high bar squat trains and how you can utilize it from an application standpoint in your training to achieve certain outcomes of adaptation. We're also going to be discussing the deadlift in today's video and showing you guys a whole deadlift workout after this high bar workout, but we'll focus in here first. So the high bar squat, what does it train from a biomechanical standpoint? Is it true that it's more quad dominant in comparison to say the low bar squat? The answer is gonna be yes. For the vast majority of human beings on the planet, when you take a high bar squat position, what you'll find from a side view when analyzing the bar path in relation to the joints of the body is that in the bottom position of the squat, your knees will be in a more forward position, thus eliciting more what we call moment arm or demand on the knee extensors. Now, I don't have a visual to draw this up and show you guys, but if you've taken physics, I'm sure you could just visualize this. And if not, I'm going to link an awesome article by Greg Knuckles within the description box that really kind of showcases this. But put simply, yes, it is true. Your knee, expen your knee extensors are going to receive more demand in a high bar squat, especially in the bottom position. But that's not all that increases. In fact, almost every joint that is responsible for some kind of force within the squat receives more demand in the high bar squat. So in actuality, the high bar squat compared to the low bar squat is really nothing more than the same exact exercise, but the leverage slightly changing. So in a low bar squat, because the bar is now lower down your back, you're going to have a slightly different movement pattern and you're just going to have better leverage over the bar. But what's actually interesting is that your upper back T-spine extensor muscles are going to be put under the largest increase in moment arm in relation to a percentage increase than any other joint in the body. So what I'm trying to say here and what Greg makes a great point of in this article, and he's really the first one who ever pointed this out to me, is that your upper back T-spine extensors, as you can see here as I get bent over in this high bar squat there on that PR, those are under more demand than say your quads, aka your knee extensors, or any other joint that's increasing in demand from the high bar squat. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean the high bar squat is quote unquote more back dominant or anything like that because in application, usually speaking, if you're a low bar squatter is utilizing a high bar squat pattern, you're not going to be lifting that maximally on this lift except from time to time on some top set or something like that. The vast majority of your exercise application with a high bar squat should be done actually with slightly submaximal loads. And as you can see here, I'm actually even using a closer stance with and really sinking the hell out of these squats. So just from the added increase in range of motion alone, we're going to see more demand in the quads, more demand in the back muscles, the core muscles, etc. And then on top of that, because of the bar position and me being in a position of less leverage, we're just going to see more increase in demand. Now, obviously, there's the benefits of of my elbows and shoulders being less beat up from a high bar squat position. And there's a host of other benefits as well. But if there's one argument I would make for what the high bar squat truly trains is it's going to help you stay more upright and rigid in your squat. Now, this can come from a number of adaptations. It can be from your knee extensors getting stronger, aka your quads. It could be from your upper back muscles learning to be more rigid and extended in your squat. It could be from your core getting stronger. It can be from a host of things, even the increase in range of motion, because most people can sink a high bar squat a little bit deeper. Thus, you train your bottom position and stability a little bit more. So there's a, a lot of things that can take place and transpire. And this video is not long enough for me to really go over the details, but the argument I'm trying to make here is it's such a reductionist statement to say that the high bar squat is just more quad dominant. There's a vast majority of other things going on from an adaptation standpoint and really how you apply your high bar squat in your training is really actually probably going to have the biggest outcome effect. For instance, a lot of people would program high bar squats for um, you know fixing knee recession in their low bar squat. They're like, oh, I'm gonna get more quad activation and thus this will make my knees not shoot back in the squat and I won't tip over as much. But the problem is if you just go really heavy on high bar, for people who deal with knee recession, what I found from a coaching standpoint is they see it even worse on their high bar squats. And so if you just program really heavy high bar squats with no intent to your form, you're actually not gonna get any desired outcome change for that adaptation towards your knee extensors, staying more in the game, so to say, 
during your low bar squat, and you'd probably want to program them a little bit more submaximal. However, likewise, if someone's dealing with a really weak core and upper back, and they don't have an issue with their knees receding in the squat, I'd probably opt for a lot heavier um, higher RPE high bar squat. So, you know, even how you apply this within your training program with something as simple as how heavy you're going can vastly change the outcome and the desired adaptation you're getting from, say, a high bar squat. So there's there's a ton of nuance to talk about here. And I actually want to do a deep dive video one of these days and pull out the whiteboard and kind of show you guys some more nuance. But for today's video, I'll leave you guys with this. The high bar squat is much more than extra quads in your low bar squat or building up your quads bigger. You got to think a little bit deeper and how you apply it really, really matters. I'll do a future video covering this. Now, really quickly to get back to the training vlog, what you guys just saw before this exercise was a front rack position, plat squat with 1.5 reps. So basically I was doing a front squat with super large heel elevation with a very narrow stance and I was doing 1.5 reps, meaning I go down into the hole and then about halfway up out of the hole and then back down into the hole and then I finish the rep and that is one rep. I was doing those to get a lot of quad activation. So actually kind of what we were just speaking about because my knees are in such a forward position and because I'm biasing the bottom position of the squat and spending so much extra time under tension there, I'm going to actually receive a ton of quad activation that way. And in fact, if I was dealing with someone who had really, really weak quads and really small skinny legs, that's actually the exercise I would give them a little bit more than say a high bar squat, although I'd probably be throwing some high bar squats in there too, because I consider it more of a secondary exercise that you follow up, say some high bar or low bar squatting with. But anyway, uh, after that here, I had some Bulgarian split squats with the barbell, still keeping these relatively light. So you'll notice everything on this day was pretty light. I was trying to ease my way into this because I had such a heavy high bar squat workout and I had a ton of back down volume. So I didn't want to overwork any of my connective tissues. Uh, anyway, so I was doing some Bulgarian split squats here with the barbell. I actually really like these with the barbell more. It's a little bit easier to overload. My grip doesn't fatigue as much and it's, it's just kind of easier overall. And even though it's actually more more unstable feeling, I'm able to go heavier on these. So I'm actually really excited to push these in the coming weeks. And I think it'd be pretty cool to get these to say like three plates someday. Um, as you guys know, I was after that three plate walking lunge and I was very close to it. I was doing 275 pounds and then my fucking adductor decided to snap on me mid rep. So that wasn't fun. And that sucked because all the weeks before I was just PRing like crazy. And so that's kind of the, the risk you run whenever you're introducing a new movement. If you get strong really quickly at it, sometimes your connective tissues and those muscle bellies can't keep up with your CNS and how much neural adaptation you're receiving from the exercise. And you really got to be careful. So that's actually why I'm keeping these so light. I mean, these are probably honestly like RP sub five, but I'm just trying to get in some blood flow and get the movement pattern down, get my tissues acclimated. And then as I start to progress over the weeks, I'll be able to add load safely. Now, guys, um, right here, I'm showing Izzy how to do GHR sit-ups. Now, again, I need to do a deep dive video and I promise eventually I'm going to do more sit down videos. Lately, I've been doing a lot of voiceovers because I haven't had time to honestly sit down and film B-roll and do all that. These are a lot quicker to edit and film. They only take about an hour to do plus another hour of editing. But anyway, uh, with that said, these GHR sit-ups are fucking amazing. It's basically like combining a sit-up with a plank or some kind of anti-extension movement, I guess you could say, and a hanging leg raise all in one. So it's gonna train your hip flexors and your deep core muscles like the psoas and that rectus femoris. Uh, so that psoas kind of runs along the hip flexor complex and is really deep inside the core along with the TVA, which helps draw in your stomach. And those kind of all work in unison in some way to help perform hip flexion slash drawing your core inward. Now, along with that, the abdominal wall obviously crunches your, your body and flexes you over. And then with that, we also have uh, what we call anti-extension, which is really what a plank and some of the movements where you're focused more on stability and really not letting the back position change, the spinal position change. Um, those movements are basically your ab wall and the TVA and a couple other muscles like your obliques holding everything in place. And so this exercise targets all these functions. 
at the bottom here, you're going to see Izzy as I'm kind of instructing her on how to do these. She's going to avoid going into overextension in her low back, which is actually really hard to do on these as you go really deep with the dumbbell. So right there, she never overarches her back, and that's the anti-extension part. And then as she comes up, she's actually driving her legs into the top of the pad to lift with her hip flexors. Same thing on the way down. We kind of use both the hip flexors and the abdominal wall to contract our way up to the top position. So you get this nice amount amalgamation of three coordination patterns all combined into one. And this really is like the most complete core exercise you could do. Now, her biggest issue is she was having trouble actually getting everything coordinated at once. So you can really fuck these up. <laughs> and I know this because I did these wrong for years. I, I used to do these like eight years ago and I was just kind of flinging myself up. But the way you want to do it is you see how at the top I get a very clean visual crunch so you can actually see I'm entering spinal flexion. This is very important to target the ab wall. But along with that, notice how my legs are really straight and I'm, I'm keeping that knee almost locked and driving those ankles into the pads as I'm kind of like lifting my toes up towards the ceiling. And then on top of that, at the bottom, I'm preventing any kind of extension in that low back. I'm trying to keep the core engaged as I go down. And so we're getting that stability effect, which will have carry over your squats and deadlifts. You're getting that ab crunching effect for hypertrophy benefits and really just getting a lot of blood flow to the ab abdominal wall. We're getting the hip flexors involved, which is very, very chronically underworked in power lifters. So overall, that's just an amazing core exercise. It's by far, if I only had one core exercise I could do for the rest of my life, it'd be that one. And the truth is, these days, I don't do many other core exercises. There, there's some I'm doing for just my general handstand work and some of the other stuff you guys have seen me doing. But for the most part, when it comes to just training your core for strength, functionality, et cetera, all in one, that's going to be my go-to. Now, moving on to the deadlift day here, I am starting to deadlift pretty heavy on the secondary day. So this is kind of my lighter deadlift day. And on this day now, I have ascending sets of five up to about an RP five to six. So I keep this day auto-regulated and we don't have any back down sets. It's just ascending sets, which means I do the repetition range all the way up on all my warm-up sets. So you can see here, I'm going to take this 375 for five and then I'll go 485 for five. And then my top set on this day was 551 pounds. So my general rule of thumb whenever I'm doing ascending sets is I treat the warm-ups exactly the same as how I would build up to a top set but I just do sets of whatever repetition range it calls for. So here, normally I'd probably just do a single or a double with 485, but now I'm doing set, a set of five to get in some extra volume. So this kind of keeps me a little bit more trained, a little bit more volume inducive on the training day, but not so much where I'm having to do a bunch of back down sets or anything like that. So it's kind of like a, a nice cheating way to get in some extra volume. It doesn't really tire out your top set as much as you think it would, especially if you get used to it and acclimate to it. And you can see here, this is 551 for five and I'm ripping it up really really easy and this is on a secondary day um, this actual weekend actually after this workout I pulled 640 like ridiculously easy for an intro single into the next block because it is a deload wave load week so we're going a little bit lighter and you guys will see that video here soon but just kind of pointing out that you can go pretty heavy on the secondary deadlift days if you're built for uh, deadlifting twice a week and this is again another video I really want to cover but you know some people especially sumo pullers sometimes they can only handle one real competition style deadlift day per week because their hip gets aggravated conventional pullers sometimes they get smoked from just pulling heavy once a week other people like myself i can handle pulling decently heavy twice a week um, now, of course, the secondary day is nowhere near as heavy or as high RP as my primary day. So I want to make that clear. It's not like I'm pulling actually heavy two days a week, but there's a decent amount of load on the bars where a lot of other people would opt for, say, just a Romanian deadlift or, for instance, these stiff-legged deadlifts that I'm doing after. And so that's worth pointing out here, too is the way I get in some extra volume on this day is not just with the competition deadlift, but after I do those ascending sets, I'm on these deficit stiff-legged deads that you guys have been seeing me do. So when we uh, were introing this, uh, this secondary deadlift day into the training cycle, we started really submaximal. It was actually percentage-based. So it was very, very low percentage for like really low reps. It was mainly triples and doubles and nothing near failure. But now that I'm getting acclimated to the secondary day, I'm pushing it a lot 
lot more. And so we have ascending sets of five where it's auto-regulated. And as you can see, even on this first week of having these, I got all the way up to 551 pounds. So it's very promising. Now, the cool thing about this is, yeah, there's a little bit more fatigue, but guess what? I'm going to peak harder and I'm going to be able to train the deadlift a little bit harder. So because I can pull twice a week and not fatigue myself too much, um, the awesome benefit I get is my peak on my deadlift hits a little bit better because when I pull out that secondary day on peak week, I usually have some really awesome feeling deadlifts on my primary day when I go to test my new one rep max or I do a meet. The other awesome benefit is that you're training your deadlift really twice instead of just once. So obviously, if you can recover from that and you're not feeling too beat up to the point it's affecting your other heavy deadlift day, it's a great way to get in a lot more practice and a lot more total training volume in the deadlift throughout a training year. Now, I don't always always do this. Sometimes I opt for just Romanian deadlifts or stiff leg deads or another variation on the secondary day. Um, but there are a lot of times, especially when I'm trying to push my deadlift, which I'm currently doing right now, where I opt for that. So anyway, after that, I was doing some uh, barbell good mornings here, as you can see, seated, a uh, very full range of motion. Now, God, I have said this so many times in this video, but we're going to say this one more fucking time. I need to do a video explaining the difference between this and say a Romanian deadlift. I'm seeing a lot of people, like a lot of coaches claim these exercises are the same and they're, that's not true. These, these exercises are not the same. They target similar muscle groups, AKA movement pattern. Um, and it is technically just a hip extension movement pattern, but the way the moment arms are distributed within the spinal erectors and the hip extensors is vastly different between these two exercises, mainly because of leverage. So um, there's a lot to discuss here with strength curves and uh, resistance profiles. And there's a lot to just discuss from a, the pragmatic lens of how you would apply both of those within a training program. I think the obvious uh, way I can just convince everyone on the spot that Romanian deadlifts are not the same as good mornings is I dare you to go as deep as you go on your RDLs with a good morning and see if you can use the same load. Since you obviously cannot, I think it's pretty clear to call those exercises the same is a little bit of a, a reductionist statement. Um, and that seems to be my favorite statement of the year. <laughs> it seems like in, in YouTube fitness, there's a lot of reductionists out there. And so I want to clear the air. Now, I'm not saying the exercises are vastly different. They obviously train similar things. But I will say this. I definitely utilize Romanian deadlifts far more for strength effect than I do good mornings. And I think most coaches do that. Good mornings are going to be more for mobility or very, very specific um, spinal erector strength issues in the squat or the deadlift. Dan Green was known to do standing good mornings with an SSB with a limited range of motion, so not quite as deep as his RDLs, and he'd go pretty fucking heavy on those, and he actually did that for his deadlift back strength uh, carryover, so he really wanted to strengthen his spinal erectors to be tight and strong in his deadlift, as where an RDL is probably going to be a little bit more hip extensor dominant. So, I will do a deep dive in future videos, um, finish up there with some rows after the good mornings, and then I moved on to some incline dumbbell curls with my shoulders really pinned back in a very strict range of motion. So again, application's everything. You can't just do an incline curl and get the same effect as someone doing this the correct way. So the correct way of doing this is you're going to want to have a lot of shoulder external rotation and retraction to the scapula to maximally stretch that long head of the bicep, which crosses that shoulder joint. And then you're going to want to pull up without the shoulder moving at all. And if you do this, you're going to get a nice lengthening effect on the bicep, which can actually help clear up a lot of people's shoulder irritations and some other problems they may be having or some bicep tendinopathy. So this is a really awesome bicep exercise. You get a crazy stretch and pump. But on top of that, it's also really healthy for the biceps and that shoulder head. And that's pretty much the video, guys. If you're interested in our group coaching, go sign up. Use the link in the description box, and I will catch you guys in the next video. Please comment down below. It really does help out the channel whenever you guys comment down below.